Thank you all for coming to the seminar. There should be more coming. We'll ho hopefully they'll turn up. Uh, so welcome today. We are very uh, lucky to have Professor Andrew Schwartz from the University of Colorado here to talk to us, uh, give us his views on mandatory disclosure. Thank you. Uh, well, th thank you very much. Um, bef before I start, let me thank uh, Victoria uh, for inviting me, I think, on my suggestion. And um, as well, the, uh, the Banking and Financial Services Law Association um, for financial support to come down here from Auckland, where I'm currently based at, at the University of Auckland Law School. I'm in residence there. Uh, it was supposed to be for six months, but it's now become 18, um, fortunately, uh, because of the COVID situation. It's uh, um, much easier for, uh, for, for my family and, and me to, to be here. Um, uh, and just, to, just speaking of my family, um, I've got uh, four kids, and uh, three of them play rugby now, and none of them wear shoes. So I think we've, we've adopted the, the Kiwi lifestyle as, as much as we can. Um, but so I am uh, sincerely uh, honored to be here at this you know, lovely uh, building on a fine day. Um, and the, the paper that I'm going to present is called Mandatory Disclosure in Primary Markets. It's based on a paper that I published, uh, I guess, last year. Things got a little bit delayed uh, this year, as you understand, uh, in the Utah Law Review back in the States. And in this paper, I, I pose a novel challenge to the central pillar of financial markets law here in New Zealand and around the world, mandatory disclosure. Uh, my talk today is going to proceed in three parts, tracking the paper, which is available online. Um, first, I will describe what I call the modern theory of why mandatory disclosure is the centerpiece of uh, I might call it securities regulation out of habit, um, but, but that's the same thing as financial markets regulation. Um, and then second, I'm going to present my claim that this modern theory in favor of mandatory disclosure really only relates to secondary markets, meaning where investors trade securities with one another. And the modern theory is generally inapplicable to primary markets, which is uh, when companies offer securities directly to investors. This leads to the possibility that a primary market could succeed without mandatory disclosure. Third, third part of the paper, I'm going to use equity crowdfunding here in New Zealand as a real world example of a primary securities market that works well without mandatory disclosure. Okay, so part one, the modern theory of mandatory disclosure. In the olden days, going back hundreds of years, stock exchanges were private clubs in Amsterdam and New York and London, elsewhere. They regulated themselves, and members of the exchange had a direct financial incentive to treat investors fairly, because their livelihoods depended on clients coming back again and again to trade in the future. Um, and whereas entrepreneurs seeking to raise money might be tempted to embellish the truth or, or fib wholesale and take the money and run, members of the exchange or the exchange itself could not afford to be so short-sighted. So they uh, had a financial interest to and generally did look out for investors. But by the 20th century, uh, stock exchanges had become public affairs with millions of participants, um, and government regulations were imposed. In the US, we have the, the pillars are the Securities Act of 1933 and the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. Here in New Zealand, uh, you have a series of Securities Acts going back uh, decades, and most recently, the Financial, Market, uh, the Financial Markets Conduct Act of 2013, the FMCA. And the core feature of all of these uh, securities regulations is mandatory disclosure. And by that, I mean a legal mandate that certain information be provided to investors before they invest. So currently, the FMCA sections 48 to 50 uh, require a product disclosure statement be provided to investors 
Formerly, it was a prospectus under the Securities Act. In the US, we call it an S-1. Um, but this is a, a disclosure document that, that's legally required um, to be uh, completed and, and filed and uh, made available to investors. Um, and the FMCA up in the very front in sections three and four emphasize, uh, emphasizes the importance of informing investors, saying this is the, a core purpose of the entire act. And this builds on prior law like uh, re-AIC merchant finance from 1990, uh, which states uh, the broad statutory goal of the Securities Act, uh, quote, is to facilitate the raising of capital by securing the timely disclosure of relevant information to prospective uh, subscribers for securities. So mandatory disclosure is the, is the key, the core feature, the pillar of financial markets regulation. But mandatory disclosure is very expensive. Um, it takes lawyers and accountants and investment bankers. Um, and to, to do an IPO, an initial public offering in the US at least, costs somewhere in the neighborhood of four to six million US dollars. Um, still, there's a broad global consensus among lawyers, regulators, and scholars that mandatory disclosure is necessary and worth the price that we pay for it. This consensus is premised on what I call the modern theory of mandatory disclosure, which I shall describe in just a moment. But it's truly a theory. It's, it's, it's not based on empirical findings. There's just too many confounding variables at play um, that generally, I would say scholars in the field generally agree. It has not and pretty much cannot be empirically proved that mandatory disclosure uh, is, is worth the cost or, or is not worth the cost. Um, but so, so the modern theory is, is, is a consensus view, but there are a few, at least a few, academic at least, dissenters who, who agree that disclosure is valuable, very important. But they contend that disclosure will come about voluntarily without the need for mandatory disclosure, without the need for legal mandates. And the key idea uh, among the dissenters um, is founded in law and economics. And that is this, essentially. Companies seeking to raise money and exchanges, uh, stock exchanges, have an incentive, an economic incentive, to voluntarily disclose relevant information to prospective subscribers. Because otherwise, no one would invest. I mean, just picture a simple example. If your brother-in-law asks you to invest in his business, and you ask him to you know, tell me a little bit about the business, and he says, no, I'm not going to tell you anything about it it's very unlikely that you're going to hand over your money. So by the same token, entrepreneurs seeking to raise money uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a stock exchange offering, they must share information to convince people to hand over their money. Otherwise, investors won't invest. Or, at the very least, they will discount uh, the price that they're willing to pay and only pay a pittance per share to discount for the uncertainty of, of what this business uh, is all about and its prospects. The dissenters believe that the common law prohibition on fraud is adequate to ensure that any disclosures made voluntarily are truthful and, and not misleading. Um, and beyond that, the exchange itself, as in the olden days, the exchange itself has a long-term interest in ensuring that investors trust that they are being treated fairly so that they will come back and, and invest again. Um, so exchanges can and do, like the NZX, can and do um, impose strict listing standards to determine which companies will be allowed uh, to offer shares on the exchange. Um, and the exchange can discipline or, or even ban brokers who cheat or, or, or mislead investors. Thus, to the dissenters, mandatory disclosure is superfluous and in fact harmful because it orders the wasteful disclosure of information that neither the company nor investors think is worth discovering and disclosing. Um, dissenters expect that an, an efficient amount of information will be disclosed voluntarily and 
uh, the very high costs of IPOs in the US and the dwindling number of public companies and the fact that the only companies that can go public are enormous, that can afford the $5 million uh, transaction costs, mean that many, many uh, you know, worthwhile companies are not offering shares to the public and perhaps they would in the absence of mandatory disclosure. So the dissenters make a, a strong case based on law and economics, but other economic, uh, excuse me, other academics, really beginning primarily in the, in the 1980s, um, they have responded using uh, law and economics concepts of their own, and they have developed what I call this modern theory. The modern theory claims that there are market failures that will systematically lead to insufficient disclosure, not an efficient amount. So we cannot just leave disclosure to voluntary choices based on market incentives. And the modern theory uh, points specifically to two, uh, to two specific market failures. And I'm going to go into these in detail. Number one, agency costs. And number two, not a great name, but information under production, going for maximum syllables on that one. Um, so uh, number one, a agency costs. Um, public companies have what we call a separation of ownership and control. The company is owned by shareholders, but run by managers. And these two groups have different interests. But when it comes to disclosure, it is the managers, it's management who decides what to disclose. So if certain information shows that management is doing a poor job running the company, or is wastefully spending company money in ways that benefit themselves personally, or there's other certain information that is possibly embarrassing uh, or paints them in a bad light, um, the shareholders would want to know about this stuff but management might well decline to disclose it as a matter of self-interest, absent a legal duty to do so. And that is a, a market failure. Um, mandatory disclosure um, not only uh, forces the disclosure of this sort of misbehavior by the agents, by management, but it also deters management from misbehaving in the first place for fear of having to disclose uh, bad news, like, or, or you know, to, to uh, management might think twice before using the company jet to fly to Las Vegas for the weekend if they knew they had to disclose this to the shareholders. Um, so that's agency costs. Sound, it's a sound argument. Second, second pillar of the modern theory of mandatory disclosure is, again, I, I welcome a better name, but information under production. This is based on the idea that it is socially useful for market prices to be accurate. Uh, prices uh, on the NZX or you know, other uh, stock, stock prices to be accurate. And the valuation of a given stock, a, d a given share of a given company depends on information. Um, but companies might not voluntarily disclose valuable information relevant to prices, which would be socially useful, especially when the benefit of that information goes to others, in particular competitors or the market as a whole. Information costs money to discover, to collect, to tabulate, to explain, and a company should, and, and, and perhaps and, and we can expect would, rationally decline to do all that work when the benefits will go to others, in particular competitors or the market as a whole. So let me give an example that I think uh, clarifies this idea. Um, Macca's, well in America we call it McDonald's, but sometimes Mickey D's. Um, Macca's sells a lot of Coca-Cola. Um, Macca's is in a very good position to, they can relatively easily collect the data on how many Cokes they sell each day compared to last quarter and things like that. And that information would be very useful to investors in Coca-Cola stock. But it would cost Macca's time and money to collect and present that information, 
Should we, so we should not expect MACAs to voluntarily collect and disclose its Coca-Cola sales, even though that would be socially valuable by making Coke stock uh, more, more accurately priced. And similarly, there's information that other firms hold that would be useful to value MACA's shares, KFC reports or Burger King, or things like that, Domino's. Um, but they won't collect and disclose it voluntarily either. So what we have here is really a collective action problem where all the companies whose shares are traded, all the companies would benefit from each other's cooperation to share the Coke sales, to share the beef production numbers or, or things. Um, but that won't happen voluntarily. And so information will be underproduced. Mandatory disclosure can solve this problem too and enhance the informational efficiency of stock prices, which is good for all companies and all investors and, and is socially valuable. So to sum up, the modern theory holds that mandatory disclosure is needed to solve two market failures. We cannot just leave this to economic incentives because of these two economic uh, market failures. Number one, agency costs. Number two, information underproduction. This is a compelling argument that has swept the field, but I think it's time to reconsider the scope of the modern theory. And this brings me to part two of my talk, which is my claim. My claim is this, that the modern theory of why we need mandatory disclosure relates only to secondary markets where stocks are traded amongst investors and not to primary markets where companies uh, issue shares in exchange for consideration. So let's review those two components of the modern theory and see why they are, at least I claim, irrelevant in the primary market context. So remember, number one, agency costs. Agency costs refers to the potential for misbehavior by agents, meaning corporate managers in control of a company funded by the shareholders. But at the time of a primary offering, there are no agents yet. It is only after investors have put their money in that managers can abuse their position and use that, use that capital to benefit themselves. Before that moment, agency costs are just impossible. Thus, the concept of agency costs just has no logical application in the context of primary markets. Number two, information underproduction. Remember, this relates to accurate pricing of securities as they are traded in the secondary market. I'm, I'm pointing to the NZX, which I think is, is it that way? Okay. <laughs> um, so, but uh, at the accurate pricing of securities as they are traded in the secondary market, it's entirely about the secondary market for shares that are actively traded and where one company like Macca's has information that's relevant to the share price of another company like Coca-Cola. It has nothing to do with primary offerings. There is a small exception here, I, I will confess this. Um, a company doing a primary offering may have information relevant to the value of shares already being traded on the secondary market. For example, Tesla, the electric car maker, when Tesla did its IPO, it may have had information about electric cars and batteries and things like that that may be, have been useful to traders in Ford or Toyota um, or, or Nissan. Um, but that's an exceptional situation. Most newly public companies do not have much relevant information, uh, information relevant to the pricing of uh, currently traded firms. Also, the IPO is a one-time event. Um, so, Whereas agency costs, I claim, is entirely irrelevant um, to, uh, to, the, to the primary market, information under production is almost totally irrelevant to the primary market. So I therefore claim that, that these two market failures that underlay the modern theory of mandatory disclosure, even accepting them as correct, do not apply to the primary market. Thus, voluntary, uh, excuse me, voluntary disclosure may therefore be optimal for primary offerings. And in this way, I have to respectfully disagree uh, 
with I think section three, possibly section four of the FMCA and uh, re-AIC merchant finance's view that mandatory disclosure is a vital component of a primary market. But also, my analysis, my claim here today, conveniently resolves the long-standing argument going back decades between the dissenters who support voluntary disclosure and the, the consensus view that mandatory disclosure is required. Because the dissenters often or generally focus on primary offerings to show why voluntary disclosure is best, like the example of my brother-in-law uh, is, is a primary offering. Whereas the majority often focuses on secondary offerings to explain market failures. They, the stories they tell are, are, are just about two different markets. So it's very possible that both groups are right and they're just talking past one another. So going forward, we should refine our analysis of mandatory disclosure rather than simply saying mandatory disclosure is necessary or wasteful. Um, we ought to really delineate between primary and secondary markets. One final point here. Um, even if you accept my theory and agree that primary offerings can go on without mandatory disclosure, you might ask, what difference will it make? Since the moment after the primary offering concludes, the secondary market will commence and mandatory disclosure will then be appropriate under the modern theory. To this I say, not every primary offering is followed immediately or ever by secondary trading. And it is theoretically possible to have a primary only securities market open to the public. And in such a market, mandatory disclosure could, and I say should, be eschewed. Moreover, this is not only theoretically possible, it has actually happened right here in New Zealand. Which brings me to the final part of my talk. Equity crowdfunding in New Zealand. The equity crowdfunding market in New Zealand was established by the FMCA of 2013. And what the equity crowdfunding market is, it's a real world example of a primary only securities market open to the public that operates and has succeeded without mandatory disclosure. Just by way of background, what is equity crowdfunding? It's an online tool for people to invest money in entrepreneurial companies and receive a share in return. It's like Kickstarter, except instead of putting $20 in and getting a CD from the band, you put in $20 and you get a share of the band's profits from their upcoming concert. FMCA Schedule 1, Section 6, check if I'm right, um, exempts equity uh, crowdfunding from mandatory disclosure under Part 3 of that Act. Rather than a, a set of mandatory disclosures, it's up to the hosting platform, the website, and the, uh, the offering company to decide which information to disclose and how to disclose it. There is no PDS or anything else filed with the FMA. It is a voluntary disclosure regime. And once the securities are issued, that is the end of the deal. There is no organized secondary market for crowdfunded securities. Thus, equity crowdfunding here in New Zealand presents a test case for my theory that a purely primary uh, market can succeed without mandatory disclosure, where private incentives at least the theory goes, private incentives should, in theory, produce an efficient level of disclosure, just like investing with your brother-in-law. And in fact, over the past five or six years since equity crowdfunding came into being, private market actors in New Zealand have organically developed a, a number of effective um, methods of private ordering to ensure that an appropriate amount of disclosure uh, is, is provided to investors without a legal mandate or uh, a form to fill out. And let me just mention two of the most important methods here, privately generated uh, methods. Um, uh, I, I use these terms, but I'm not alone to use them. Uh, number one, gatekeepers, and number two, syndication. Uh, let me just briefly describe each of these. Um, 
by gatekeepers. I mean, the, uh, for, to do an equity crowdfunding offering, you have to use a, um, uh, an online platform, which is a website, sort of like a mini stock exchange. And the two biggest in the, com in the country are called PledgeMe, based here in Wellington, and Snowball Effect, uh, based in Auckland. And these online platforms are themselves licensed by the FMA to do this type of business. Um, and it is in the economic interest of a platform to be selective when companies asked to list on their website. They act as gatekeepers. The platforms want investors to come back again and again and again. It's absolutely vital to their business model. Um, they also could lose their license uh, if they misbehave. Um, so these platforms only allow promising and legitimate companies to list. They refuse to list a company if there's any hint of fraud um, or maybe uh, you know, if uh, business failure um, looks, uh, looks like a real po po probability. Um, so so they, they are gatekeepers in that, I mean, Snowball Effect, their CEO was quoted in the newspaper as saying, we list about 2% of all the companies that come and, and see us. Um, they're a very strict gatekeeper. And the platforms demand that each issuing company provide a, a reasonable, maybe efficient, amount of disclosure in a format that is sensible uh, to investors. So that's gatekeepers. By syndication, the other private ordering method to, uh, to police this, um, this, this marketplace, by syndication, I mean, it's, it's not universally the case, but it's very common in a crowdfunded offering for there to be a large lead investor or a cornerstone investor to invest $100,000, $500,000 into the offering. And this large investor, usually an angel investor, a venture capitalist, that type of person, they talk to the, uh, the company issuing uh, the stock. They conduct careful due diligence. Um, and this, by, by them uh, putting, putting uh, a significant money at stake, this lends credibility to the offer. And smaller investors putting in $500, $1,000, $100, um, smaller investors trust and follow the lead investor because he has skin in the game um, and, and has uh, you know, conducted this careful due diligence and, you know, like I said, put his own money on the line. So five or six years into this experiment, the results are pretty good. Uh, in New Zealand, there have been dozens of companies funded through equity crowdfunding. A f very, relatively few big successes so far, but uh, only a handful of uh, business failures, which is to be expected in startup companies. Um, and I'm, I'm unaware of any companies that uh, were claimed to have been fraudulent um, and just taken the money and run. Now, equity crowdfunding has, has not become a rival to the NZX, but it's doing all right. Now, the equity crowdfunding law in the United States, which New Zealand modeled its off of, um, but the US, our crowdfunding law, did not abandon mandatory disclosure. It, there's a reduced amount of disclosure, but there's still a specific form that must be filed with the SEC with specific items that must be disclosed. Um, so it makes for a useful comparison. U.S. Uh, equity crowdfunding kept mandatory disclosure. New Zealand uh, got rid of it. So how, how are each one, uh, how are they doing? Well, if we scale for the size of the economy and we focus on the most recent data from each jurisdiction, New Zealand has hosted about three times as many campaigns uh, as, as the U.S. New Zealand companies have raised about 10 times as much capital as, as US uh, equity crowdfunding companies. And New Zealand has had about 50% more investors participate than the US. Now again, this is scaled uh, based on the size of the economy or, or population. Um, and admittedly, uh, you know, I'm proud to say the US is catching up, but New Zealand has, has really um, uh, demonstrated something here because New Zealand's crowdfunding law is not only different than the US, but there are crowdfunding laws around, around the world, in Korea, in Indonesia, in France, in, uh, all, all over the place. And New Zealand's law is, uh, I think, unique or practically unique in completely abandoning 
mandatory disclosure. And New Zealand's market, scaled, is definitely a world leader in this uh, nascent field. I think this is no accident. Rather, I see New Zealand's success in equity crowdfunding as a vindication of the claim I make in my paper, that mandatory disclosure is superfluous and harmful in the context of primary markets, and that a primary market uh, will really flourish uh, if permitted to operate under a regime of voluntary disclosure driven by economic incentives. So to conclude and sum up my paper and my talk, I challenge the global consensus that mandatory disclosure is a necessary component of a prudent financial markets regime. I claim that the conceptual underpinnings of the modern theory in favor of mandatory disclosure hold little relevance in the context of primary markets. And this theory thus predicts that a primary only market should be able to succeed without mandatory disclosure. And then finally, I used equity crowdfunding under the FMCA to provide a real world example that is consistent with my theory. So thank you very much for your time and attention. And I look forward to your, your comments and questions.